look back at an extraordinary event in naval history at Scapa Flow in June 1919. einige Schiffe heben, um wenigstens ihren Schrottwert zu retten. Zwanzig Jahre nach Scapaplo, Einheiten der neuen deutschen Kriegsflotte auf hoher See. For some Germans it was a symbol an inspiration for the future. For others, it was the last stupid gesture of a stupid war. For the British, it was both an act of hunnish treachery and a jolly good thing. Today, it helps the local Orkney tourist trade. And there are plans to turn what was once a naval supply base into a commemorative museum. As a matter of history, the scuttling of the German High Seas Fleet at Scapa Flow on June 21st, 1919, remains the greatest single day's loss of shipping ever recorded, and at that self-inflicted. Ten battleships, five battle cruisers, five light cruisers, 32 destroyers. Half a million tons worth of arms race sunk in an afternoon. The port of Wilhelmshaven on the other side of the North Sea from Orkney is a more lasting product of that same arms race. Today, it is more leisure and commercial than military importance, but Wilhelmshaven was purpose-built as home port for a new German navy that was intended to dispute in the 20th century the waves Britannia had ruled unchallenged during the 19th. The Wilhelm that the new port took its name from was the German emperor, the Kaiser himself. Like other arms races, it started as a balancing act. The brainchild of Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, seen here with Kaiser Wilhelm II at the 1912 launching of the liner Imperator. Tirpitz argued that a German navy would not have to be bigger than Britain's, merely big enough for German overseas ambitions to be taken seriously. Also, the building of a navy would help stabilize as well as boost a booming industrial economy and be a source of pride to a restive population. With the passing of the German fleet laws of 1898 and 1900, the Tirpitz theory became state program. The Germans and especially the leading personalities had the feeling that um, Britain was in the way of the developing German empire and therefore uh, it was necessary to have a fleet. And Tirpitz said, if you have a fleet, in a 20 years time with 60 big ships you will be in a position to challenge and even uh, to challenge uh, the British the Royal Navy and even you will have uh, a chance of succeeding in a battle between uh, the German North Sea coast and the Thames. There had never before been a German Navy to speak of. The men, the ships, even the dockyards to build the ships were all new. Anything more foolish than for the Germans to spend all these millions year after year cannot well be imagined. 
Sir Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty from 1911. And yet the continental upstart had to be contained. Tuppitz uh, built the fleet systematically. And this was, uh, on the one side, of a very great advantage. On the other side, it was um, a danger, or it was uh, a manner in which uh, Tirpitz couldn't answer uh, to the British uh, reactions to the build-up of the German Navy. The result was war. While millions died in the Flanders mud, the British Grand Fleet lurked at Scapa Flow under the command of Admiral Earl Jellicoe, and with a fleet of battle cruisers stationed in the Firth of Forth under Admiral Lord David Beatty. Only once, in May 1916, did the two fleets sail together to engage the German High Seas Fleet in a full-scale battle. The British were to call it Jutland and think they had won. The Germans reckoned they had won and remember it as Skagerrak. Losses in life and tonnage were much the heavier on the British side. And yet the German fleet was never again to venture in strength out of its home ports of Wilhelmshaven and Kiel. Jellicoe, who according to Churchill was the only man on either side throughout the war who could by his actions lose it in an afternoon, had not lost. This battle was strategically uh, a failure for the German side and strategically uh, um, a success of uh, the Royal Navy. Uh, and success meant that uh, the German Navy was not in a position to uh, break up the British blockade. And the British blockade was a weapon um, during the war, which I think was uh, one of the decisive weapons. This remarkable sequence shows the arrest, pillaging and destruction of a coal ship. About as much as the German surface ships could achieve, given the relentless success of the British blockade. By the beginning of 1917, German submarines were claiming half a million tons and more sunk each month. But that only brought the Americans into the war. food situation of the men was quite uh, not very good. The situation of a fleet uh, always lying uh, at Chile Grede, at, at the moors, for, uh, at anchor, uh, doing nothing, uh, having no fight as the submarines or as the military uh, at, at the Western Front. This is a boring situation and in this situation uh, or a lot of a feeling from the Naval Officer Corps is necessary to keep men on uh, a high level of morale and this um, the Naval Officer Corps didn't see, especially not uh, on the big ships. The big ships skulked at Wilhelmshaven. The men below decks had plenty of time for reading the newspapers. They knew that the safety and release of armistice were close. The officers took a different view of the situation. They developed the idea that um, the German Navy uh, should sail for a last heroic, heroic battle uh, between the Thames and uh, the <coughs> German North Sea coast, just to show that uh, the German Navy and the battle fleet uh, had um, a real function in uh, the German uh, build-up, political build-up of a uh, uh, great power and, as Trotha said it, to lay the foundations by this last heroic battle, to lay the foundations for a new German Navy. And this idea uh, <coughs> was developed inside the um, staff of the uh, German High Seas Fleet uh, it was put into an order on the 24th of October 1918 and it was uh, discussed and the order was issued to the commanders of the uh, ships, of the big ships, um, in Wilhelmshaven on uh, the 29th of October uh, 1918. And uh, it was cl quite clear this was not a militarily necessary operation, but it was a political 
um, it was in a political demonstration. The German government had offered armistice on October 5th, 1918. Negotiations dragged on throughout that month, a kind of global endgame in which the high seas fleet was a key pawn, except that the men had already decided to resign. Immediately after the order was issued, the men on the big ship, uh, ships knew what was going on. And they had quite different ideas about what was uh, to do now in this time at the end of October. And they had only one goal, to end war, to end war and uh, to go home. And um, therefore, they had only one possibility, just uh, to use um, their own um, function and uh, to put the fires out uh, on the big ships and so the naval officer corps couldn't order anything because the men didn't obey and uh, you know that on the 30th of october in wilhelmshaven and uh, on the 4th of november in kiel uh, there was what afterwards was called a revolution a rebellion a mutiny uh, these um, events happened and uh, the result, uh, the military result of these events was the destruction of the command structure of uh, the Imperial Navy. The dream of Tirpitz, architect of the German Navy, was finished. It was the men who had refused, not the ships that had failed. And a lethal mixture of social chaos and revolutionary fervor swept Germany from Wilhelmshaven to Kiel and Hamburg and onto the streets of Berlin. On November 9th, the Kaiser abdicated and fled to Holland. Two days later, the armistice was signed. In the capital, civil war. In Wilhelmshaven, confrontation between what was left of the old order and a mushroom growth of workers and soldiers' councils. In the middle, Article 23 of the Armistice, which specified that the ships of the High Seas Fleet were to be interned. The task of preparing for internment was reluctantly accepted by Admiral Ludwig von Reuter. Reuter's son, York, recalls a hard decision. I remember it very well as I, I was at, uh, it was in 1918 and uh, at the time I was a young boy and I remember he uh, went through our garden back and, uh, and forth, back and forth and uh, uh, later when my mother told me he was uh, thinking about this problem, he was asked to lead the, the internment fleet according to the armistice uh, to foreign harbors, you see. The Entente um, discussed it and they were not all uh, in agreement what should done with the fleet and what not. So the, it was open and he thought uh, there were possibility to save it for Germany, at least a part of the, uh, the fleet. 73 ships and 20,000 sailors crossed the North Sea into internment. Among them, on the battleship Kaiser, a young man called Werner Brandsberger. There were by us on the ship very few older marine soldiers who, for this revolution, agitated. And these people were, however, nach Möglichkeit an Land geschickt und durch neue, frische Soldaten ersetzt. Und da ich als vierjährig freiwilliger, kriegsfreiwilliger auf dem Schiff war und sehr für Deutschland eingestellt war, da habe ich und auch sehr viele andere mit der Revolution nichts zu tun gehabt und noch nichts gewollt. They were strongly influenced by the uh, workers and soldiers' councils. And there were many difficulties, even when they left, only to say one example, when they left uh, Germany, the German harbors, the uh, <coughs> soldier councils wanted to hoist the red flag. 
my father and his staff could uh, only change this at uh, telling them uh, that uh, this red flag means that uh, there are sea robbers. On sea robbers, one can shoot without warning. And uh, I was Jesus, we were done. We wanted to go to the house and we said to the father and the mother, that it didn't take too long. Da kommen sie bald wieder. Bei uns auf Chile Rede, also kurz vor äh, Wilhelmshaven, ihr, ihr legen und ihr wartet, bis wir den Befehl kriegten zum Auslaufen. Und dieser Befehl kam dann am äh, äh, 19. Äh, November äh, und äh, wir waren seeklar, wir hatten alles, äh, alle Munition und alles äh, abliefern müssen. Wir hatten aber für ein halbes Jahr äh, Öl und Proviant und äh, Kohlen und äh, so weiter, was, was wir brauchten. Deshalb sind wir gefahren, auch ohne irgendein Bord. Das wir hatten gar keine Gedanken dran irgendwo vor Angriffe zu machen und so wir fuhren ganz stolz und freudig hin. Wir wussten, dass das für uns alle, auch für die Familien zu Hause besser wird, wenn alles wieder in Ruhe und Frieden seinen Weg geht. Und da haben wir dann nach ungefähr einer Fahrstunde eine, eine unübersehbare äh, Flotte von den Alliierten, Engländer, Amerikaner, Franzosen, Japaner, äh, Neuseeländer. Wir waren erstaunt über eine derartige große Menge von äh, Kriegsschiffen. On November 21st, the German ships reached the Firth of Forth. The British Admiral Beatty waved his cap to his men and the cameras. The safety first strategy of the war had denied him a Trafalgar. Next best thing to a blazing victory was a blaze of publicity. It had been rumored in Wilhelmshaven that the British sailors too were ripe for revolution. The reality was decks cleared for action and a mood to match the newsreels and the newspapers. Uns wurde Befehl gegeben, in, äh, in Kiellinie, das bedeutet also ein Schiff hinter dem anderen, nicht? Die Route wurde vorgeschrieben, wir äh, links, äh, also Steuerbord- und Backbordseite in je ungefähr 300 Meter Entfernung, da äh, waren die alliierten Schiffe und äh, hatten uns in der Mitte also eskortiert. Los, wir haben uns so, für uns so gelacht, der, der, der hat das, der, 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 der englische Flotte, wie wir es mit so auf See waren, da, da kamen sie uns entgegen und von beiden Seiten mit geschwenkten Rohen, da waren noch Bange, dass vielleicht doch noch, wo er falsch hätte oder steckte da dass wir noch nur sie angreifen wollten, oder was? Interessant äh, bei der Geschichte war, wir äh, mussten von einem vom äh, Arbeiter- und Soldatenrat eine äh, zehn Mann, rund zehn Mann Besatzung mitnehmen und die trugen dann eine rote Binde und die hatten sich am Fallrepp 
aufgestellt und wollten dann die Engländer begrüßen, aber die Engländer, die sind schnurstracks da vorbeigegangen und der Arbeiter- und Soldatenrat, die sind ganz bescheiden äh, abgezogen. What Beatty persisted in calling the workmen's councils were not represented when Reuter formally handed the high seas fleet into internment. Conspicuously, Beatty did not attend either. The terms of the armistice had led Reuter to expect a neutral port of internment. Scapa Flow was as far from neutral as it was from the creature comforts of urban civilization. A deep water anchorage sheltered by the islands of the Orkney group, Scapa had long been the key to British naval control of the North Sea and North Atlantic. Reuter's own first view of Scapa, perhaps hardly the most objective, is recorded in the book he later wrote Nothing but mountainous, rocky islands. The naked rock showing through the heather. Farmhouses of local grey stone, with barracks and hangars relieving the sameness. But a general impression of ugliness. On November 23rd, 1918, the German ships came into Scapa Flow, almost like so many lambs entering a lion's den. At least one man was moved to poetry. Friedrich Ruger, who was to become head of the Federal German Navy after the Second World War, was in 1918 first lieutenant on the destroyer B-110. The B-110's cook was Karl Heidebrunn. Die Rohre leer, die Kammer leer, so zogen wir hin ein entwaffentes Heer und brachten unsere Schiffe mit einer Hand nach Zauberflug. Dort liegen wir so manchen Tag, doch komme, was kommen mag, zerbrochen die Macht, doch nicht unser Stolz. Wir sind geschnitzt aus dem Holz, wir Deutschen. Internment was not surrender, but it was captivity. Captivity is never a pleasant thing, the captivity of defeat still less so. Add to that monotonous food, denial of shore leave, uncertainty about the future, and the fact that the German ships had not been designed in the first place for being lived on week in, week out, and the complaints that have come down to us from that winter in Scapa seem reasonable enough. But Scapa was no picnic for British servicemen either. I never got ashore during the war, it's four years at Scapa, based on Scapa except once, after all, it must have been about two years, the war has been on for two years. And I have no recollection of what I saw on shore, so it couldn't have been anything very interesting. <laughs> Hector Matheson was a junior engineer and chief cartoonist on board the battleship HMS Erin. He spent most of the war at Scapa. On the upper deck on a decent evening, Everybody off duty on the upper deck, trying to get fresh air. It was like Princess Street on Saturday afternoon. And that was bad enough until the roller skaters got busy. It was really danger to life and limb then. You see some of them trying to shoot overboard, getting hanging onto the railings. People used to say that if a chap was missing from the ship's company, they'd say, where is he? Oh, he's gone sick. What's his trouble? And they used to say, he must be scap a tap. And that was a, they treated with levity, a, a serious situation where people, a nervous temperament would succumb to worry, or people had anxieties about it. their own people at home, They're brooding on the subject. You know. So if any fellow was acting a bit queer, they used to say, he's getting scap a tap. It brings to mind the dictum of Dr. Johnson, no man would choose to go to sea in a ship who had the contrivance to get into jail. For to be in a ship is to be in jail, with the added danger of being drowned. 
On the German destroyer B-110, Friedrich Ruger was poet, ship's musician, and his own kind of cartoonist. His scapper ABC was a very personal collection of rhymes and drawings. N is for New Year, booze and good cheer. N for the north wind that rattles our gear. Life was hard, but on the smaller ships, a certain comradeship developed between officers and men. The big ships had their compensations too. Und uh, da unser uh, Schiff uh, eine Länge hatte von 172 Metern und eine Breite von 30 Metern, da konnten wir uh, 100 Meter Lauf und so weiter und so weiter machen. Das war natürlich ein großer Vorteil gegenüber den kleinen Kreuzern oder den Torpedobooten. Ab und zu sind wir da auch mal mit dem kleinen englischen Pirnasboot mitgefahren an ein anderes Schiff und haben es da begrüßt. Und wir sind alle froh und gemütlich wieder auseinandergegangen. Kein Haare, kein Streit. So haben wir die ganze paar Monaten, wo ich da war, ganz gut gelebt. So haben wir Skat gespielt, Schach gespielt äh, und so weiter und so weiter und haben uns, äh, ja, haben uns lang, äh, gelangweilt nicht? und haben Fische gefangen mit einem Zwirnfaden und einer eine Nadel unten dran und dann haben wir äh, Fische gefangen. Home leave from that strange half prison was even more strangely allowed. Reuter went home for Christmas. Ruger stayed, listened to Caruso from a wind-up gramophone on a neighboring ship, and consoled himself and his crew with poetry. Dann kamen wir kurz vor Weihnachten stolz und da hat uns der Admiral Herr Ruger noch dieses Gedichtchen vorgetragen. Ein Bäumchen kurz so zusammengefiecht, ein Licht, ein Lied uns genießt, ein bisschen deutsche Fröhlichkeit, Gedanken an alte und kommende Zeit, das war unser Fest. Sind viele geblieben an Land und im Meer, sie haben selbst schon freudig her, ja alles. Zum steht ihn nicht nach, wenn unser Glück auch ein Stück gebracht. Wir schaffen es neu. Du brüht auf an der Arbeit nun. Beiseite den Streit. Lass den Hader ruhen. Es helfen die Drogen so fast mit an für unser Deutschland. In late January 1919, Admiral Reuter returned to his post with the intern fleet at Scapa Flow. He was coming back to a cauldron of discontent, particularly on the capital ships with their soldiers' councils. This model shows the high seas fleet at Scapa without the British ships that guarded it. Disarmed and with crews reduced from a full complement of 20,000 men to below 5,000, it posed no threat. The British were unconcerned at internal German dissension. If the pot boiled over, it would be an excuse for seizing the ships. Otherwise, when armistice became peace, the fleet would be divided among the Allies and Britain get its lion's share. Or so the British thought. The Americans, notably Secretary of State Daniels, who visited Orkney in the spring of 1919, thought the German fleet should simply be sunk in mid-Atlantic. They also thought that thereafter, American industrial muscle could ensure a shipbuilding program that neither Britain nor any other European power could match. But America as future rival was under discussion at the highest admiralty levels. By April, Beatty and Madden, for instance, were arguing for the politically biggest possible share of the German ships. Just a few months earlier, they would have been happy enough to see them sunk. 
Meanwhile, incessantly roller-skating revolutionaries on the iron decks of the Friedrich der Grosse were making it impossible for Reuter to hear himself think. He had a lot to think about. He moved his admiral's flag to the much less fractious Emden and from there set about reducing the fleet crews to an absolute minimum, skillfully weeding out the troublesome as well as the unfit. On June 21st, if a peace settlement were not achieved at Versailles, the armistice was due to run out and a state of war at least technically be resumed. By then, there were to be only some 2,000 loyal and trusted men on the fleet that was Reuters and his country's pride. There was no other way for him as an officer of honor either to sink the fleet and uh, as it was not uh, honorable to leave the ships in the hand of, a, of, 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 a, of, a, of an uh, of the enemy during the war and yet to suppose that the war had uh, begun again. And on the other hand, he couldn't defend as they were disarmed, so they were only left the only possibility to sink them. Whether Reuter acted on his own initiative and strict sense of sailor's honor, or according to a plan hatched in Germany, will never be known. What is known is that the British fleet chose June 21st as a day to be out of Scapa Flow on exercise, leaving the German ships virtually unguarded. And yet, June 21st was the very day when the armistice had been due to run out. It was extended at the last minute, but Reuter wasn't informed. Officially denied a radio and without access to newspapers less than four days old, he either didn't know or could reasonably claim not to. For Reuter, the war was on again. Meanwhile, at the small fishing town of Stromness on mainland Orkney, June 21st had also been chosen as the day for a special treat for some two to three hundred school children. James Robertson is one of several who still remember. I was just about to enter my final year at Strumness Academy. Our headmaster had just come back from the war where he was a colonel and he had a lot of influence locally and so he obtained for us the use of a Liverpool tug called the Flying Kestrel, which was to take all of us who wanted to go down to have a look at the intern ships. The journey for me began five miles on my bike from outside the window here down to Strumness, where we all piled on the ship. And I was keen to go. The only one of our family and nine who volunteered to go but I remember my mother distinctly giving me money to buy biscuits or something. And I can tell you, I bought orange cream biscuits, but they were never eaten. Everybody was planning what they would do and had been warned by their teachers that they had to behave properly and that they had to show no signs of uh, hate or, or, or anything, no signs of friendliness either, which I thought was rather hard and uh, not to wave to the men or anything at all. And we were on our way before we were told that the British fleet had gone out the day before and left only the hospital ship, which was the Victorious. We set sail and we were all excited and happy. I was a wee bit dubious about going to see Germans because I had a great fear of them. I remember very well us the, standing on the boat and watching everything as it went past. And then we noticed it was like an avenue made by the destroyers. The destroyers were lying in pairs, just one in a, a row the whole way along, and then another row here, and each in pairs, a pair and a pair and a pair. And we went down this avenue between them. My old friend George Mendon had been carefully briefed by Colonel Hebern to tell us the names of the ships as we uh, came by them and this he did very well. Uh, we were also uh, asked not to jeer or gloat over a beaten enemy. We just saw the occasional uh, sailor 
German sailor and noticed several things. Everybody was busy taking down the names of the ship because it was going to be a sort of competition to know how many that you had seen and the names of them. As the flying kestrel chugged through the ranks of the high seas fleet and the school children jotted down the strange sounding names of the ships, the German officers and most of the men were far too busy to pay much attention. The Bumpenmeister's mat Otto Bries der für die Flutung verantwortlich gewesen wäre, der musste sich an dem Vormittag am, am 21. Juni in der Nähe des äh, Kommandanten aufhalten und der äh, Signalgast, der äh, stand auf der Brücke mit dem Fernglas und hatte nur dauernd den äh, Emden in, im Glas und äh, um 11.30 Uhr, da äh, schrie der Funkmat Heinrich Fuchs, Signal 11 äh, gezeigt und dann hat der äh, Kommandant gesagt, bestätigen, also wir auch, dass äh, die Flagge äh, Paragraph 11 gesetzt und äh, der Kommandant hat gleichzeitig dem äh, Otto Priest, dem Pumpenmeister Smart, den Befehl gegeben, die äh, Seeventile zu öffnen und der hatte dann gegen 12 Uhr dem Kommandanten, Kapitänleutnant von Wippern, Bescheid gegeben, Seventile geöffnet und die Schrauben mit Hammerschlägen verbogen. Das Schiff macht Wasser. And approaching Lioness, a rumor somehow hit the ship that something odd was happening. And on checking this, we saw that some of the ships were adopting an old attitude, mastheads leaning over and that sort of thing. And of course we were well down into the flow when a trawler, and this was a trawler, came up from the flow, came along a good bit from us because they talked on a megaphone, funny enough, through the megaphone, and he said, turn back, the German fleet are sinking. And there was a great consternation on board then. What was going to happen? Was he going to turn back? And the captain decided, no, he put on then. We'll carry on. And they said, we'll carry on to Victorious. And that is actually what we did. But all the time then, there was the great spectacle, of course, of this uh, fleet beginning to sink. Every ship was sinking or taking up a different position, going down by the head, or heeling over. One or two of them sank on an even keel, such as the Hindenburg. Some of them went uh, down by the stern, and others shuddered and shuddered and toppled over, and there was great big cascades of water. Oh, it was very, very frightening. But they had all raised their flags to topmast. Every ship had its flag flying when they were scuttled. I think that was a wonderful uh, action for them. After all, it was their fleet. And although they had been defeated, they were to go down with flags flying. And they were really afraid for the safety of the boat, that the suction of the chairman ships going down would pull the boat we were on down. The destroyers actually just settled in the water. They didn't perform. It was the capital ships that really made it an entertainment. They went down by the end, they turned over, they stood up, one stood up on its bow and fell into the water, and the sea was just churning all the time, and men were being swept off the rafts and off the boats as they'd left the ship. Wir anderen Matrosen und Unteroffiziere und so weiter, die noch auf dem Schiff waren, bekamen den Befehl, die Barkas und das Schiff zu verlassen. Wir, also übers Fahlerepp, nicht? Und in die Barkasse geklettert. Wir durften nur das Notwendigste im Seesack mitnehmen. Ich hatte noch die Gelegenheit, wir hatten ja mehrere davon, eine Reichskriegsflagge, wie sie hier im Kleinen gezeigt wird, hatten wir noch an Bord. Und die habe ich mir um den Bauch gewickelt 
und habe die mit durch die Gefangenschaft gebracht. It was a fairly calm day. There was no waves or anything like that. And so there were a number of small boats, but not only small boats, hundreds of men swimming all round. I was afraid for the men, of course, being on the rafts, and sometimes you would see about seven men, and then the next time you saw the raft, there would be about three men left, and there were men swimming in the water, men landing on the beaches of the islands there at Carver and Flotta, running up over the grass. There was great commotion, and we saw uh, maybe a few chairmen on little rafts leaving the ships, and there was uh, men swimming in the sea, and I was terrified they were going to come on board and do for the lot of us. We were ungefähr in 500 meter Entfernung, and our ship das uh, kenterte nach Steuerbord, and uh, es uh, zeigte dann den roten Schiffsboden. Und äh, dann mit einem Male, da war es weg, da war es weg. Und da haben wir noch ein dreifaches Hurra für unser stolzes Schiff Kaiser. Dann haben wir dann mal Hurra, Hurra, Hurra geschrien und da war der Kaiser verschwunden. At Orfe, on mainland Orkney, a funeral was taking place while the German ships were sinking. It's said that the minister suddenly found himself talking only to God and the departed. The mourners had gone off to watch an altogether grander kind of funeral. As we came along, Victorious was lying like that. Uh, the flying uh, kestrel came in and we actually bumped Victorious. And everybody yelled. And some children, of course, were crying and that, but I was so excited about it all that I really quite was quite intrigued with what was going on. And across then to make the triangle, there was a, a trawler that they used, you know, they used them in the fleet. Well, on this trawler, there were armed sailors along the, right along the bulwarks, you know, along the edge of the ship. And they were aiming their guns into well, what it would have been lifeboats, I would think. Good big boats. And there were German officers sitting in them, in the boats, and the guns were being trained on them all the time. To our horror and amazement, we heard what none of us had ever heard before, but we were quite unmistaken about it. The sound of bursts of machine gun fire and also heavier guns. There weren't many rounds fired, but there were several bursts and several rounds. Und das äh, äh, ist leider äh, Tatsache. Von den Bewachungsfahrzeugen wurden wir in den Rettungsbooten noch von den Wachbooten der Engländer beschossen. Und wir hatten insgesamt zehn Tote und 16 schwer Verwundete die während der Versenkung noch ihr Leben lassen mussten. Some people say there was no panic. I say there definitely was, because I remember distinctly our teacher taking us below and trying to play games and whatnot, and eventually we got away from it all and we sailed back to Stromness and got just a royal welcome. The people of Stromness were all down the pier. Practically everybody that lives on the seaside has a pier. And the folk were all down the piers to see what had happened to the children. And of course were rejoicing when they had all got back safely from this wonderful adventure. Mother, of course, was today to see me safely home. And she told me then about the, what she, she had watched to the end of the pier where we lived the commotion and what not, and she'd run up the stair to a brother of mine who was home with the Navy and leave and said to me, James Robert, do you know what that Germans are doing? No, mother. They're shrinking their ships. Yes, mother, and if that had been the British, you'd have said, what brave men they were. In the immediate aftermath of the scuttling, the British newspapers gave full vent to their jingoism. The British government publicly did the same. 
Privately, it was rather different. Lloyd George, for one, had always thought the German ships would be better sunk, while Admiral Weems of the British delegation at Versailles called the scuttling a real blessing. Beatty and Madden thought otherwise. The Americans smiled and the French were furious. What was not disputed was that the British Navy had got egg all over its face. At Scapa, Reuter and his men were placed under arrest and taken south to prison in England. Reuter fully expected to be put on trial, but neither a suitable charge nor the will to find one was forthcoming. And in January 1920, Reuter was allowed home to Germany with the last of his officers and men. The Peace of Versailles was signed just one week after the scuttling. There were some in Germany who saw it as the final futility of the ruling class which had brought about the war in the first place. But for most people, the news of Reuter's action came as something rather more than light relief. Social historian Dr. Barbara Marshall has made a special study of provincial Germany during the period. The general impact, I would say, was one of tremendous enthusiasm. Uh, immediately, the flags were shown uh, on the university, um, outside the uh, biggest newspaper, on the town hall. And when I say flags, I mean the old imperial flag, the black, white and red flag, not the um, republican uh, flag. Um, there were demonstrations uh, in the main square, speeches, um, parades through the city, one of tremendous enthusiasm. And um, you have to see it in connection with the uh, profound humiliation which people felt over the Treaty of Versailles. On the whole, people were very depressed and dejected because not only had they fought the war for four years, they had also quite unexpectedly lost the war because the uh, German High Command had put out the propaganda that all uh, the German nation needed was one last effort and the victory was going to be in their grasp. The whole atmosphere was one of sullen resentment, a profound humiliation that this Republican government should uh, sell national honor uh, too cheaply. And, uh,